Welcome. In this session on linear data analysis, we'll explore a basis and we'll relate this basis to the rank of a matrix. So let's suppose, let's suppose that a matrix A is all real numbers and that there are M rows and N columns. The rank of A, it, we can define that as the number of linearly independent rows. And now there are some facts about rank. And facts are true things that we won't prove right now. So facts are is um, A, let's put a dot there, A is full rank. If A is full rank, then the rank of A is the minimum of the number of rows and the number of columns. Another is that if, if the vectors that are the columns of the matrix are linearly independent, pendant, then the rank of the matrix is the number of columns. Observe that we defined the rank as the number of linearly independent rows. And so if the columns are independent, that means that the rank is the number of columns. So now what we're seeing is there are some relations between the independence of the rows, which we get from Gaussian elimination or the RREF, and the linear independence of the columns of a matrix. We know that if the number of rows exceeds the number of columns, then we can say that the vectors that are the columns are dependent, or let's say linearly dependent. Let's think about the null space. If the null space of this matrix is trivial, and by trivial we mean that it contains only the zero vector, then the columns are linearly independent. So the null space is instantly telling us something about the number of linearly independent columns, and the number of independent columns will tell us something about the rank of the matrix. So if the null space is non-trivial, so if the null space of A is non-trivial, by which we mean there are non-zero vectors in, uh, that's trivial, then these are dependent. So let's continue. Let's make an observation. If A, let's suppose that A has the same number of rows and columns, and we'll, we could let that be either of them. Here, I'll just let, them, let the number of columns be the number of rows. So if a matrix is square, that's another way to write a matrix is square. If A is that, 
and the rank of the matrix is the number of rows or columns, then I can make two statements. One is that A is invertible. And that's an important matter, that the number, so if the rows of the matrix are linearly independent, then I can invert the matrix. And you can reason that out by doing the RREF of uh, a block um, partition matrix, which is A followed by the identity, and then all of this, and then when we do the RREF, that second block will become the inverse. And if the matrix is square and it's full rank, then the columns, which are vectors, are a basis for all vectors of size m. So now, let's start to think about some other concepts. Suppose that what we have is, let's consider, let's draw a little line here. And now, let's suppose that we're given a different situation. So consider, suppose we have a set of n vectors, vectors, and each one of these is, let's say, a vector vj, and each one of these has m entries, and these are, suppose that this entire set are linearly independent. Then we know that they are a basis for a vector space of dimension n. And there's a little more, because now we'll do what Professor Jacoby recommends. He says invert always invert. And what Professor Jacoby meant wasn't, your first idea is wrong. What Professor Jacoby meant was, if you take a different viewpoint on your problem, you might arrive at a greater insight. So now, we have a set of n vectors, and each one of them has m entries, and these are linearly independent. We can then reverse this entire process. Here, what we were doing was we were taking a matrix and we were breaking it down into its columns. Now, let's try the inverse, which is let's take a set of vectors and let's gather these as a matrix. And so it doesn't matter what order we take. Let's say that it's V1, V2, and so on. And now there are n of these, and so A is, A has m rows because there are m entries to each column, and it has n columns because that's the number of vectors in the set. Then, from the definition of a vector space, from the way that we constructed it, that means that, let's start a new column here. That means that for any non-zero vector, suppose we have a vector C that is in the vector space that is spanned by these vectors V, that for any non-zero vector C that's in that vector space, there is a unique linear combination where we can represent C as a first weight times the first vector plus a second weight times the second vector and so on until 
we have represented all of the vectors that we were provided with. So the proof for this is there are many forms. And most of the proofs of this involve some kind of reasoning for contradiction. Let's now convert this into a matrix vector. That means that there is a unique solution to, well, if we take these vectors and we gather them as A, and then I take these scalars W1, W2, and so on to Wn, and I gather those as a vector W, then they have to equal C. And that means that there's a unique solution. Now, suppose that there are not as many columns as there are rows of A. That is, suppose that we're given a, a we have a smaller dimensional vector space, V, then there are entries. So we now have this vector space V is a proper subset of this. And what we're saying is that even in that situation, there's a unique set of weights that will combine to represent any vector C. And that's something that happens even if A is, well, in this case, it's what we refer to as a tall, thin matrix. So in a tall, thin matrix, the number of rows exceeds the number of columns. And if those columns are linearly independent and a new vector C is in the vector space that's spanned by those columns, then there is a unique W that will represent all of them. And we can find these by uh, using some techniques that we'll explore later on.